And this is Steve Zeltzer. The collapse of the United States supported government and military in Afghanistan raises real questions about the future of the United States internationally. And one person that has raised the issue of, of what the labor is doing internationally is Kim Sipes. He's the author of the AFL-CIO Secret War Against Developing Country Workers, Solidarity or Sabotage, and KMU Building Genuine Trade Unionism in the Philippines, 1980 to 1994. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, Steve. Good to be here. So, Kim, you have spent a good part of your uh, career as a academic, a professor studying the role of U.S. unions internationally. And the United States right now has been defeated in Afghanistan militarily, right. yet the United States has over 800 bases all over the world. It spends $750 billion a year on the military. And what is the relationship of the U.S. unions to the U.S. military and U.S. interventions around the world? Wow, good question, Steve. All right, now also, I mean, just for your listeners, uh, to give them a little more background, I'm also a former sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps. I turned around during the war in Vietnam. Fortunately, I didn't go to Vietnam. I, I stayed in the States the whole time. So I'm going to bring a little different take to this than, than perhaps a lot of uh, trade unions would be. But one of the things that I did in my book that you mentioned, from which was published in 2010, was that I really tried to understand the AFL-CIO's foreign policy. Now, a lot of people don't think it has a foreign policy, um, but that's not true. They have had it. It was started in the late 1800s under Samuel Gompers. Um, it has developed uh, over the years. It's something that's not talked about. It's not even acknowledged. Um, members of the afl -C <clears throat> excuse me, uh, AFL-CIO unions generally do not know anything about it. Um, so it's a subject, while near and dear to my heart, is, uh, is largely unknown to a lot of people. And what I came to do in this book, and I've done in subsequent research, is I've tried to understand why. Because to me, you know, I would think, and this I, this is the way I started out, was assuming that working people in the United States and their organizations, such as the AFL-CIO, would um, be out there working to help workers around the world improve their lives and try to make things better for them and their, their families and things such as this. Well, what I found out is the AFL-CIO, uh, first initially under just the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, and then after the merger in 55, the AFL-CIO, has had its own foreign policy. And basically, that foreign policy uh, is developed around the idea that the United States should run the world. Um, now, where they get this, I, you know, I'm not certain. Um, but this has been something that the, that, that the AFL and then the AFL-CIO has been pushing, like I say, since the end of the 1800s. Um, so what, you, what we have a history of is um, the AFL-CIO foreign opera apparatus. Now, keep in mind, it's separate from what's happening in the United States. Um, like I say, most unions don't even know this is out there. But they have been operating. They've been operating now. It's coming from within the union movement, but they, it means that they have worked with the CIA to help overthrow democratically elected governments, such as in Guatemala in 1954, in Brazil in 1964, and Chile in 1973. They also worked to help uh, support the... the uh, uh, coup attempt in Venezuela in 2002. So we have this really weird phenomena of the American workers labor organizations actually working against other workers in and across the what we used to call the third world, the countries of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Um, now, you know, uh, well, and, and like I say, this is all being done behind the backs, but in the name of American workers. And I've been fighting, as you, as you pointed out, for basically for over 40 years, uh, along with people like 
the late Fred Hirsch, who was who somebody I have a lot of respect for and worked closely with, uh, as well as others, to try to get American workers to start paying attention to this. In other words, to, to take their focus larger than just trade union concerns here in the United States, because this is happening around the world, like I say, behind our backs with no knowledge of workers. So the AFL leaders have never given a, an honest report about what they're doing, where they're doing it, what, why they're doing it, why those countries, things like this. So for example, today, the Solidarity Center, which is the, which is the international wing of the AFL-CIO, is operating in something like 60 countries. Why? What are they doing? Um, now, they're not as bad as it used to be. I'll admit that. Thank goodness. Uh, what they did in the past was absolutely atrocious. Today, now and then, they do a few good things. But we don't know what they're doing. And they have never, like I say, they have never given an honest report. They've never told us why they're in those countries. They've never told us what they're doing in those countries or anything such as this. So it's an ongoing problem. Um, and that what I've been doing, like I say, for the last 40 years is try to bring this out in light and so that people would start saying, wait a minute, uh, if we're going to do this, we at least need to be informed. And uh, to date, the AFL-CIO uh, has refused to inform their members. And we're speaking with Kim Sipes. He's a professor and longtime <laughs> investigator on the role of the AFL-CIO U.S. unions around the world. And Kim, the, uh, the, you have been trying to get information uh, about the uh, role of uh, the AFL-CIO International. What, what are your efforts uh, are, have been and how have you been uh, prevented from getting the information? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, I've, I've read damn near everything that's been published uh, in the U.S. and around the world where I can find it. Uh, the biggest problem is that, uh, you know, the AFL-CIO doesn't publish uh, uh, um, accurate records. You can't trust their stuff. Um, you find information such as, see, the, the main operation, the main um, program they're working through is, a, is a tr an atrocious thing called the National Endowment for Democracy. Now that sounds wonderful, National Endowment for Democracy. Who could be against democracy? Well, this was set up by that real Democrat lo loving guy, Ronald Reagan in 1983. And, and it was created through the US Congress. It's funded by the US Congress. And it's an operation that is designed to support um, the US empire around the world. Now I've got to stop for a minute here. <clears throat> and explain what I mean there. In other words, I'm arguing that since at least 1945, and we could go earlier, but we'll stop at 45, that the entire United States foreign policy has been designed to, um, to advance the interests of the United States against every other country in the world. Now, while the Soviet Union was existing, so up till 1991, it couldn't uh, it couldn't get its way in those countries. But other than that, and since that, the U.S. has tried to run the world around uh, the world according to their issues and, and regardless of the impact on anybody in any other country. Now, we've been taught, we in the United States have been taught that the United States is this wonderful country. We do wonderful things around the world and that our military is here to defend us. And I don't think that allows us to understand what's going on. What is going on is the elites in this country, including political and economic elites, and I'm including political leadership of both the Democrats and the Republicans, have been operating around the world trying to dominate other countries. It's not to defend the United States. It's to allow areas that, that, uh, that they want to go into for geostrategic reasons, or for minerals and raw materials, things like that. They want to be able to control the world any way they can. And the labor movement has, has worked with them. So we have the labor movement supposedly 
representing the interests of U.S. workers, not doing that, but representing and trying to advance the interests of the of the political and and economic elites in this country. Um, so, so for example, they spend uh, this year they're going to spend seven hundred and fifty billion dollars on the military alone. Now that's under Joe Biden. It's even more than Donald Trump was spending. So it's not just a Democrat or a Republican thing. Both are involved. But um, but anyway, that's seven hundred and fifty billion dollars is basically going to the arms contractors. It's not to the vets. Um, it's going to the arms contractors, and they're using it uh, to advance their interests, to advance their profits. Uh, there was a meme going around the other day showing their profits. Some of them were up like a thousand percent during the last twenty years when we were fighting in Iraq and and Afghanistan, but. <clears throat> The idea, the, the idea that we're taking that $750 million, and this comes from the American people through our taxes, but, it, but the money going to the military does, cannot be spent for education, for health care, for infrastructure, for climate change, uh, for any of these things that, w- that most of us think American workers should need, that they need and, and should have, I should say. Um, it's being pissed away. Uh, it's, it's encouraging the country to, to go into other countries to fight wars. I mean, we've been, the U.S. has fought almost continual wars ever since World War II. Some acknowledge, some not. Uh, some with the CIA and supposedly secret. We know some of these things. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff that we don't know. But it's being, it's being done. They're stealing the money from from working people in the United States and stealing that money and using it to give it to the arms producers and invading countries, killing pe- women and children around the world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't think that's what the American labor movement should be doing. And you as a Marine, are you familiar with Smedley Butler? Oh yeah, <laughs> of course. Smedley Butler is, is one of only two people to ever have won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, he's so esteemed in the, in the Marine Corps. When I, was, when I went to boot camp in 1969, every night before we went to bed, we used to, to scream out, good night, Smedley Butler, wherever you are. So he's highly regarded within the Marine Corps. Well, what the Marine Corps doesn't tell people and what a lot of people don't realize is Smedley Butler realized he was, as he called it himself, a gangster for capitalism, operated in Asia and in uh, Central America in particular. And he came to saw, see that war was a racket. And it truly is. Um, it's not being done to defend our country. It's being done to advance the interests of the political and economic elites. Well, we're talking with Kim Sipes, who is a professor and been studying the role of U.S. labor around the world. And the uh, Solidarity Center, which uh, gets over $30 million a year uh, from the National Endowment for Democracy, says it's doing good work around the world, uh, building solidarity, helping workers. In fact, right now it's been involved in Myanmar, supporting a general strike there against the dictatorship. But when it came to a general strike here in the United States against a coup and, and uh, uh, insurrection, they were nowhere to be found. Um, why and what has been the role of Trump in relationship to the AFL-CIO international operations and uh, Gershom and, and the National Endowment for Democracy? Okay, well, I mean, part of it, part of it uh, is a personal relationship, I, I assume. But let's look at what this was set up. I got off on a different tangent. Let me pull it back now. Um, when Ronald Reagan established the National Endowment for Democracy, 1983, and this, like I say, this was done completely through the Congress. It's been funded by the Congress ever since. Um, the idea here was to, was to go around to different countries and instead of them coming with, up with evil ideas or whatever and then trying to correct it, the, the idea of the National Endowment for Democracy is to intervene ahead of time and then basically get uh, civil society groups such as unions, such as uh, oh, community organizations and stuff like this 
to advance their, the interests of the National Endowment for Democracy. Now, for this to make sense, we have to understand there, there's actually two definitions of democracy, not just one like we've taught. So we're taught, you know, one person, one vote. If something uh, affects you, you get to have a, a say in it, things like that. That actually is not the whole uh, idea of democracy. That's a bottom-up democracy or sometimes called popular democracy. There's another type of democracy that they don't bother to tell us. And that's a top-down or constrained democracy that is basically elite democracy. And what they, what they are trying to do is they're basically saying, well, the elites get to make the decisions. And then once the, the parameters are established, then ordinary people can vote or they can take place in this or that, but only as long as it's within those, those limitations. So while they call it democracy, in reality, it's, it's not. It's a very constrained thing. Elites get their say. Elites, elites uh, defend uh, the scope of things. Now, the AFL-CIO, like you said, gets about $30 million a year. Something like 90% of their budget, give or take, comes from the United States government. Um, and the AFL-CIO takes that money. In fact, they're, they're, they... Uh, they compete to get their share of it. Um, but what's, what's ignored is that the AFL-CIO is one of four key institutes that basically run the National Endowment for Democracy. So there's the international wing of the Democratic Party. There's the international wing of the Republican Party. There's the international wing of the International Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO. Now, in the United States, the, the, the AFL-CIO fights the Chamber of Commerce, but overseas, they work together. You know, they work with the Democrats. They work with the Republicans for one big happy family. And this, I think, the, most, the proper term for understanding this is they have, there is a U.S. empire. They are uh, trying to advance its interests any way they can around the world. And so that Trump was part of this. I mean, he's not the first one. I mean, like I say, it goes, this goes back to Samuel Gompers, the turn of the 20th century. Um, you know, it included uh, George Meany. It included Elaine Kirkland. It included George, uh, John Sweeney. It included uh, uh, Rich Trumka. It'll include Liz Schuler or Sarah Nelson, whoever's elected. Um, Basically, they are working with them to advance the interests of the empire against against working people around the world. And you see this again and again. Now, like I said, the Solidarity Center is doing some good things. Uh, it's not all evil like the previous uh, regional institutes were. But as if and here's the thing, if they're not being evil, why don't they tell us what they're doing? Why don't they tell us where they are? Why don't they tell us who they're working with? And they won't do that. They never have done that. So in 2005, which was a real watershed year, uh, my friend Fred Hirsch, who was a plumber and pipe fitter out in uh, uh, Pipe Fitters Local 393 out of San Jose, um, Fred and a few other people in California uh, went to the AFL -C uh, the state AFL-CIO convention. They have... Uh, uh, each state has a has an AFL CIO convention, and there were over 400 uh, representatives representing 2.6 million workers. Um, this is one one sixth of the entire AFL CIO was in California back in those days, uh, and they got the, the convention to unanimously condemn AFL CIO foreign policy. Okay, it was a it was a brilliant brilliant work by folks in California. Um, so Fred came back to Chicago. The national convention was going to be in Chicago, and I think it was July of uh, 05. We mobilized here. Um, well, I should say before getting to that, uh, Fred's labor council, the South Base uh, Labor Council, sent over 5,000 packs of information to local unions around the country. Uh, I did a lot of writing of articles, speaking on TV. Fred and I were on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. 
uh, we worked very hard to get this issue into the uh, into into the convention, the AFL-CIO, and by AFL-CIO rules, California had sent their resolution to the resolutions committee, as did a number of other organizations around the country. Um, Gerald McEntee, at that time the head of AFSCME, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, who was head of the of the um, resolutions committee and a good buddy of, of John Sweeney's, he changed the resolution around and changed it from condemning the AFL's foreign policy to one uh, promoting it, took it to the, to the conference that way, would not let our side speak and got it passed by the, got it passed by the convention. So like I say, instead of condemning and, and, uh, this, this work, he got something through that, that praised it. So this was happening under John Sweeney. Um, now, Rich Trumka was Sweeney's secretary uh, treasurer. He worked with Sweeney throughout Sweeney's years from, from 1995 to 2009. And then Trumka himself became president of the AFL-CIO. Uh, if folks don't know, he just recently died. And I do want to send condolences to his family, um, you know, Anytime you lose a close family member, it's important to recognize him. But I'm talking now about Trumpka's political operation and that the AFL-CIO was, was involved and was, um, was taking uh, part in his work of the National Endowment for Democracy around the world. Now, one of the things that the AFL-CIO has never done is been, has never been willing to talk to uh, its opponents. I mean, I'm a, God, not only am I, prof I'm a professor, I'm a veteran, but I'm also a trade unionist. I'm a member of the National Writers Union. They have been for years. You know, they will never talk to me. They will never talk to folks taking this view because it's indefensible. So they ignore it. Um, and, um, and it continues again in our name, but without telling us what's going on, why it's going on. Why are, we, why are we involved in operations around the world? Nobody knows. One of the interesting things though, is that more, this is coming out more and more. Um, my book, I think was important in 2010. There've been other books, other writings since then. And you know, the information is out there. I'm not making this stuff up. It's been, it's been found to be strongly supported. Um, and you can, you can find articles. Um, I think the, the proper term for the AFL-CIO's foreign policy is, is labor imperialism because they're trying to run other labor movements, uh, not for their, the workers' interest, but for the AFL-CIO's interest and the, and the U.S. empire. You can, you can Google, la put labor imperialism in quotes, and you can start to find all kinds of stuff. And a lot of that, I'm proud to say, is some of my own. But there have not been enough people that have picked this up and made this a real issue. And I certainly welcome uh, further issues on that. And one of the countries that uh, the AFL-CIO intervened in, um, in Latin America was uh, Venezuela. Uh, what happened in Venezuela with the AFL-CIO under Richard Trumka? Well, Trumka wasn't in charge then. That was in 2002, John Sweeney was president. Trumpka was secretary treasurer, but he didn't have final say. But what happened in Venezuela, see the United States doesn't want anybody, any country to get any ideas that they can do things different or better than the US because the US knows everything. I mean, just ask the Afghanis. They, they, we've just demonstrated that very clearly. Um, the reality is we don't want people that are thinking independently, that are countries that want to develop for the needs for their own people. Uh, Hugo Chavez was democratically elected into his government as the president of Venezuela in 1998. And he did some weird things. Uh, Venezuela is a very stratified society with about 80% of the population being impoverished. And and Chavez decided that he was going to put the interests of the 80% above the, the top 20% and particularly the elite. Well, that pissed the elite off. We can't do this. 
uh, and it's not just a, an economic thing. It's a very racial thing. If you, there's a great movie called um, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. It's on YouTube if anybody's interested. But you really see Chavez as a man of the people. He was a, he was a black man. He, was, he, he had African blood in him, as do about 25% of all Venezuelan. And he really worked to make things better for the b- bottom 80%. Uh, the elites didn't like that. They decided to overthrow him. And with the help of the oil workers union leadership, a union that was very close to the AFL-CIO, they staged a coup. Uh, Chavez was put in the position of, uh, he was forced to go with him. Everybody thought he was going to be killed. Fortunately, he wasn't. But the people of Caracas on their own mobilized, went to the palace and said, we want our president back. Now, I'm not just speculating about this because I actually got the opportunity to go to Venezuela. On a, it was a short trip, 10 days, but I got to, to go there to talk to people. And what I found out was that Chavez didn't have, his, he didn't have any way to force people to do this. The people on their own went out of their barrios down the mountains to the to the uh, uh, palace and demanded that the coup uh, leaders reinstate Chavez, which eventually they did. And again, this is all a brilliant movie called uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Again, it's on YouTube for free, uh, but it shows what happened. And what I saw, so the United States and the media has been terrible in this. The New York Times, the Washington Post in particular have been very bad. Oh, Chavez was a dictator, blah, blah, blah. He was not a dictator. See, I was in the Philippines in, in January and February, of early February 1986, when Ferdinand Marcos was in power. And I know what it's like to be under a dictatorship. Uh, Chavez was not a dictator. People did not, did not fear the police. They didn't fear the army. Uh, they felt that Chavez was working to make the country a lot better. Now, there's been some controversy lately about that, but one of the things is that, I mean, with his successor, Nicolas Maduro, but one of the things is that Chavez worked very diligently to improve the lives of the bottom 80% of the population. And of course, our media doesn't like that because they don't want any Americans to get any ideas about that. Um, but, uh, like I say, the oil workers union was part leadership was part of the coup. Um, it was only after the, uh, one of the coup partners, the head of Feta Comoros, which was sort of like the nationwide, uh, uh, chamber of commerce, the guy took power and then he basically betrayed his labor backers. And then they decided to denounce the coup after they had been betrayed, not before. Uh, and the AFL-CIO covered this up. They said they weren't involved, and it, sh- it sure as hell is. Uh, they were, and it's, it was detailed. And, and uh, when I was in, I had an interview with one of the leaders of the uh, CTV, which is the uh, la- big labor federation there in, in, uh, in Venezuela, and one of the leaders confirmed that they were part of it. You know, we're not speculating. We know this happened. Since then, the U.S. has been doing everything they can to overthrow the government of Venezuela, even though Venezuela has, has uh, not, uh, not uh, tried to conquer other countries. They've worked to improve their, the lives of their people. The United States doesn't like that, so they've been working against it. Um, so we see this you know, again and again. Why was the AFL-CIO there? That's a damn good question. It's a damn good question. And this this uh, action by the AFL-CIO, as you say, is nothing new. The AFL-CIO was involved in the coup in Chile. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, it was involved in overthrowing the government of Brazil. Uh, it was uh, has a long history around the world, in Turkey, many other countries. Um, w- this ideological position that the AFL-CIO leadership have in these national unions <clears throat> Aren't they actually saying they support U.S. imperialism? That's what they believe in? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They want the U.S. to run the world. They think the U.S. should run the world. That's why 
you know, you don't see the AFL-CIO challenging the amount of money being spent on the war machine. You know, they're going along with it. Now, part of this, and, and you can understand some unions, say like the machinists and steel workers and auto workers that do have military plants, uh, their workers are, are members of their unions. You can sort of understand that. But as a whole, the labor movement has supported this. Uh, they support the, they supported the war in Iraq. They supported the war in Afghanistan, just like they supported the war in Vietnam. So yes, and and that's why, by the way, I, I mentioned it earlier. I'll, I'll mention it again. I call their foreign policy. I think that's best described as labor imperialism. So you're absolutely right. It's imperialist, and it's it's one that's not. Uh, not done for the good of workers it's against workers it's you know dictatorships jailing killing torture that's not in the interest of any worker anywhere and yet we see the afl-cio in almost every case there's a few like i say they're not but in almost every case that's the side they're on and particularly the, the case of uh the public worker unions AFSCME, aft seiu CWA, many of these public workers unions have uh, a large number of workers in healthcare and education, and yet they are silent about this military budget of 750 billion a year. Shouldn't they be fighting for that money to go to public services, healthcare, housing uh, uh, for working people in this country? I think so. To me, that's a no brainer. That's a no brainer, but they don't do that. And nobody can explain why. Well, like I say, my analysis, and people are welcome to challenge it, but you, but you better read my book and be prepared to, to, to uh, take me on because I know what I'm talking about. Uh, my analysis is that they think the US should run the world and they think that should supersede anything else. So they're not challenging the military budget. Like you point out, that's money not going into education, healthcare, infrastructure, uh, mitigating climate change, or anything else like that. Uh, the US military, by the way, is the largest polluter in the world. It's bigger than many countries. Um, does that, is that an issue for the labor movement? I think it absolutely should be. It's not. Well, there's going to be a, an upcoming uh, convention next year of the AFL CIO. Do you think trade unions should? in their locals and within fighting in their internationals to get these uh, unions to take a position against uh, US government uh, aid to the uh, Solidarity Center and, and supporting a pro-imperialist policy by the trade union movement? Oh, I absolutely do. I think, I think unions should, I think uh, members in unions should work to get their national union and through that their, their international and, and then the AFL-CIO itself to change its policy. But Steve, you gotta, you gotta think, one of the things that, that we know about many unions is that most of their locals are, are relatively inactive. You'll have a few people that are active. Uh, most of the workers, just they don't come because they don't think it's gonna talk about anything substantive. Um, you know, and people aren't involved. And the unions and the union leaderships like it that way. Uh, I mean, and, and that's one of the reasons it, it's, it's maintained. This is over 100 years old, this crap has been going on. Um, you know, if workers don't like what's going on, if workers don't think we should be overthrowing democratically elected governments, and, and you know, uh, things like that, then workers have to organize within their local unions to try to change things, but also across local unions within their national union, within their statewide federations and things like that, with the goal of trying to change the AFL-CIO foreign policy. Um, I don't see a lot of that going on, unfortunately. Um, and and I, think that's, I think that's to our detriment. I think that I mean, war and peace, how, you can't get much, uh, a much more essential thing, uh, issue before working people, or for that matter, any, any people, you know, to go to war 
condemns to a lot of death and destruction. It, it condemns uh, soldiers and Marines to go and kill and destroy stuff that they will have to deal with, with for the rest of their lives. Every day we lose something like 22 veterans to suicide after they come home, you know, because they, they, they come home, they're, they're no longer with, their, with the people in their units, they come home as individuals, and eventually they've got, when they're laying in the dark, when they're not talking to anybody, when they're thinking their deepest thoughts, what, what happens? A lot, of them, a lot of them realize, hey, I screwed up. I should have never done that. Because what it means is killing women and children. It means killing old, old men and women. It means destruction. It means death. It's terrible. It's terrible. And any veteran where, uh, 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 that thinks about this stuff has to deal with it. And so like for myself, I speak for myself, I'm not a combat veteran. Like I said, I did not go to Vietnam. I was very, very lucky. Uh, but I know had, you know, had I not got, gotten that break, however it came, that I would have done the same thing that anybody else did in Vietnam. You know, I was prepared, I was trained and prepared to kill and destroy. That's what the U.S. military does. It doesn't bring democracy. It doesn't bring freedom. It doesn't bring any of that stuff, you know, and, and yet those are the lies the American people get told and are, and to be honest, most of them don't even check it out. They don't even think about it. They just say, well, if the president says we should go to war, we should go to war. Well, I think that's bullshit. And I think it's wrong. And I think, I think we've, as a country, we've got to quit accepting this. We've got to, we've got to stop uh, allowing our elites to take our young people, both men and now increasingly women, and sending them off to war. Because and, nobody, and nobody's a threat to us. I mean, yeah. go ahead. Well, one of the other, other countries, the United States, AFL-CIO, is involved in is Israel. Uh, they support the uh, state of Israel, the Jewish state. Uh, they support Zionism. Um, Golda Meir uh, statue is in the AFL-CIO headquarters. Uh, they, many of the union leaders have bought bonds, Israeli bonds. Uh, why would the AFL-CIO support a state, a Jewish state? Uh, they say they don't support religious states, yet they're supporting a Jewish state and actually uh, remain silent when Palestinians and trade unions and workers are suppressed in uh, Palestine and in Israel. I don't know what they're doing there, but the, the AFL-CIO, just like you said, Steve, has put tremendous amount of money uh, buying uh, Israeli bonds, things like this, that help support the state of Israel. The state of Israel is a colonial settler country. They invaded a land that was already occupied, that being by, uh, by the Palestinians. Um, Palestinians are second-class citizens within Israel, and they're, they're treated much worse than the occupied ter territories of the West Bank and Gaza. You know, as you, as you know, because you've been one of, the, one of the folks that have been fighting this for so long, and I think that's, that's really to your credit. Um, why the AFL-CIO is doing this, I don't know. I think our struggle, we should be on the side of the Palestinians, uh, that we should stop the AFL-CIO from doing this. And by the way, one of the things, one of the ways that the AFL-CIO does this is because they're so tight with the, with the elites in the Democratic Party. I mean, you know, we can see, you know, anybody can see what, what uh, troglodytes most of the Republican governors are. I mean, you think of DeSantis in, in Florida and Abbott in Texas and a bunch of others. I uh, just, the New York Times had a, had a really sad story about Mississippi, also run by, by Republicans. Most of us know that the Republicans are evil, you know, or at least a lot, an awful lot of them. Uh, but we tend to think that the Democrats are okay. And the truth is, most Democrats are scum, just like most Republicans are scum. And you see this, uh, you see this over and over again. The Democrats put millions of dollars to Democratic candidates, presidential candidates, 
One case I know very well because I was in the actual meeting is there was a man named Frank Emsbach and Frank had created a thing called, uh, um, God, I'm blanking on the name right now, but it was a, it was a daily labor program. It was designed to um, workers news win. yeah <laughs> workers international workers independent news and it was daily news service it was advancing the interests of workers and unions in general uh, frank had busted his butt really to make this thing go uh, by himself for years and then i uh, i'd lost the job and he brought me in so i i was helping him at the time and he he took me to washington dc and we had a meeting with the political director of the AFL-CIO. This was back in 1984 when John Kerry was running. And Frank was asking for some money. And I, my recollection is the AFL-CIO came up with $5,000, but they, and, which was absolutely nothing. And yet they turned around and gave $55 million to John Kerry, who was absolutely useless and, was, and who had become a war criminal himself. Uh, you know, he was, he was supporting the empire and yet the AFL CIO couldn't even see a long time trade unions like Frank Emsbach and his efforts to advance the interests of work. They couldn't see, they couldn't see more than $5,000 for Frank. And I know because I was in the, I was in the room in the meeting. Um, it was, it was, I mean, they have. You know, well, the, the fact that you have no labor channel, and I'm a member of the CWA, we don't have a channel, Communication Workers of America. The AFL-CIO doesn't have a labor channel. There's a minor strike that's been going on for five months. There's no live coverage of it by the unions. Uh, I don't think they want people to get educated and unified. Is that really the logic of not spending money on their own channel, a workers' channel, a labor channel for all working people in the United States? Well, I think that's part of it. Because look, they don't want energized and organized and educated members because it, energized and organized and educated members can get out of their control. And that's one thing they fear. And, and uh, they don't want to do anything that will allow that to happen. So, so no, they're not going to do anything that would, that would help on these issues. They're not going to publicize. There's a there's a nurses strike outside of Boston, if I remember right. That's been going on for quite a while. Nurses, my God, especially in time of COVID, the whole world should be should be uh, backing that strike. The miners that are on strike that you were mentioning as well. Uh, you know, working people have been taking it in the neck for the last 50 years in this country. Uh, where's the AFL-CIO been? I mean, the last major strike you can think of was the Patco strike in 1981. And when Reagan said, boo, all these brave trade unions, they, they, they just uh, bent over and just, you know, said, let it go. Well, we're not going to take the president on. Uh, but they're not willing to fight for workers. They're not willing to, to, to mobilize these people because, like I say, they might get out of control. They might start thinking for themselves or thinking. I mean, Steve, part of the thing that we've got going on is let's, let's put this in a little historical context. As you know, uh, being another child of the 60s, the 60s really scared the elites in this country. I mean, we had the civil rights movement and that developed in the uh, black power movement. We had the women's movement. Uh, we had the anti-Vietnam War movement. And these things came together and exploded in the late 60s and early 70s. And that really scared the elites. And where I saw it was in the military is that, uh, is that these movements inspired Marines and soldiers, sailors and airmen to stand up and start uh, challenging uh, uh, conditions in the military. Some units even refuse to fight in Vietnam, and that's a death penalty offense under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the military almost disintegrated, and that scared the ruling elites. And so what they came up to replace that with is what we know as neoliberal economics. And the idea here was to break down any sense of collectivity and to replace it with ultra individualism. 
And so, for example, people were told, you know, it used to be Americans would work together, uh, but people were told don't work with anybody else because your goal is to get to the top. And if you take care of anybody else, it's going to slow you down and you might not get to the top. And they put this crap in our heads and they, they've inculcated among our young people, anybody born since at least 75's got, got this. And, you know, so only be concerned about yourself. Don't think about anybody else. That has led to the ruination of our country. And I think that's, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost. You saw that on January 6th. Um, but the fact is that Americans have, Americans and a particularly American working people have to work together. We have to quit believing the bullshit that is shoveled out in large numbers by, by uh, uh, Fox News, as well as a lot of the stuff on MSNBC for that matter. But we've got to take, take, we've got to take people and we've got to help them relearn that we have to work together. We have to develop that solidarity of ordinary people to improve our lives and to make our communities better because the elites are not gonna do it. You know, uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, they're playing games up in space. Uh, that tells me they, they're not being taxed enough. They should, they sh all these people, all these billionaires and stuff, they should be taxed. Maybe I'll get liberal and say, maybe they can have the first, first million or maybe $5 million. But after that, just take everything from them. Uh, they don't deserve it. They've ripped off people. And we need that money to take care of the American people. The labor movement should le be leading this charge. But do you see it happening? I sure don't. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking with Kim Sipes, who's a professor who's been studying the role of the AFL-CIO internationally for decades and uh, talking to us about that history and what we need to do today. So thanks for joining us, Kim. You're welcome, Steve. Thanks a lot.